Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very special Grand Rounds sponsored today by the faculty of the Office of Faculty Development. And I'd like to welcome those who are here with us in Rangos in person, as well as those of you in the virtual space. I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, for those of you who are joining us virtually, you should know that there is not a separate meet and greet link. Uh, you can stay on your current link. It is all integrated uh, for that. Um, and in addition, if you would like to ask questions of our presenter, please put them in the chat. You can also, and it would be lovely, to ask the webinar host to allow you to unmute and put on your camera and we could hear you and see you um, with your question. For those of you who are joining us here in the audience, you merely have to raise your hand with a question and a microphone will uh, magically make its way over to you. And for those of you here uh, back that direction, there is a QR code to get your MOC credit if you would like to do that. So with the housekeeping out of the way, it is really my honor to, rec uh, to welcome today Dr. Lori Weingart, who is going to speak to us about the No Club. Lori Weingart is the Richard M. and Margaret C. Syed Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. She has served as CMU's Interim Provost, Chief Academic Advisor, and Senior Associate Dean Education and Director of Accelerate Leadership Center within Tepper School. She has co-authored The No Club, Putting a Stop to Women's Dead-End Work. Her very important research examines collaboration, conflict, and negotiation with a focus on how differences across people both help and hinder effective problem solving and innovation. Her award-winning research, not surprisingly, has been covered by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, Business Insider, and many other top management and psychology journals. She lives right here in Pittsburgh, PA, where our children grew up uh, knowing each other and going to school. And today, as I uh, carpooled in with Lori, it really uh, harkened back to many years ago when we were carpooling with our children. So this is actually an extra special uh, treasure for me to be able to introduce her today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lori Weingart. Well, hi everyone. It's great to be here. It's great to see some people in person as well. Um, as Loretta said, we go way back. So I was really honored to receive the invitation to speak at Grand Rounds today. I know everyone's very busy. It's a high census time. So, um, I appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your busy schedules to uh, listen to what we have to say today. Um, so I am a card carrying member of the I Just Can't Say No Club. About 12 years ago, my colleague, Linda Babcock, sent an email to the rest of us saying that her work life was out of control. Um, she was being asked to do things that she wanted to say no to, but she felt that she really couldn't. She had a hard time doing so. Now, we were all successful women um, at, uh, in our careers, and she felt we probably had the same problem. So she sent us an email. She knew we wouldn't say no, so she just sent us a doodle poll. We went um, down the street to Union Grill and spent the next 10 years meeting regularly over bottles of wine and dinners and a little bit more wine, but just trying to figure out how to get our work lives under control. We, she called us the I Just Can't Say No Club. And over the next 10 years, we got better at saying no, um, but we quickly realized that it wasn't really fixing the problem. We were still inundated with requests to do work um, that wasn't really core to our jobs. And while we learned how to manage it and manage our work lives, every time we said no, another woman would be asked to do what we had turned down. So, uh, and, and at the same time, this didn't seem to be happening at least to the same extent to our male colleagues. Um, and while, we, uh, so while we were running around from meetings to meeting, trying to um, get everything done, our male colleagues had more uninterrupted blocks of time to do their research and their teaching. So we really wondered what was going on. Like, was this our problem that we just couldn't manage our time or was it some other something going on that was um, resulting in this? 
So we decided to take our expertise and apply it to the problem and do some research to figure out what was happening. We interviewed other people as well, and we took that um, our learnings together to really get at the root of the problem. And we really f- feel that we did do so, and that's what I'm here to share with you today. So the first thing we needed to do was put a name on this phenomenon. And we came up with the term non-promotable task. So these are the things that we do that matter to our organization, but they don't advance our own careers. So um, let me give you an example. So, and you can think about the things that you do in your day to day. So we came up with our top 10 list. And if you look at this list, you'll see there's a lot of things here that you probably identify with. Um, there are all the things we do to help our coworkers to succeed, um, organize their work, support them. There are, there's all the service work that we do, serving on committees, including DEI committees, doing logistical planning for events. I did a lot of that. Um, there's the things we do to promote, you know, harmony among our coworkers, supporting them, mentoring them, um, even resolving conflict. And then, uh, then there's that category of basic office housework. You might've read articles about that. People have been writing about that. Uh, like getting coffee or taking notes at meetings, cleaning up, those types of things that we do that, and all of these tasks are really important to the organization, to the institution, to your um, employer, but they don't help your career. They're not something that people track and pay attention to and pay you for or advance you for. Okay, so rather than just have a laundry list of non-promotable tasks, what we wanted to do is kind of boil them down to their core components. So what makes a task promotable? Okay, so there's three characteristics to look for. Um, the first one is, the, is whether a task is instrumental to the organization. Does it meet the, um, does it, Sorry, does it advance the currency of the organization or what really matters? So but just think about your job, right? So you're in healthcare. I'm gonna talk about my job as a professor uh, and what's important to the university. But you can think about this in terms of what you do within your job. So in my job, I do teaching and research and the things that I do in support of the mission of the university of advancing um, new knowledge and creating new knowledge is all those things that are very Um, important and instrumental. So for me, it's my teaching, my research, publishing papers, all of those things. Okay, so if it's not instrument as directly instrumental, it's less promotable. So serving on a committee to help design uh, the building, which I've also done, is a non-promotable task in that it's less instrumental to advancing knowledge creation. It's important but not directly instrumental. The second is the visibility of the work. So can others see the fruits of your effort, right? Is it tied to uh, you directly or are you backing somebody else up? Is someone else getting the credit for the time you're putting in? Um, Is it something that is tracked, right? In terms of performance evaluation. So for me, you know, I have to write research articles and my, the, my productivity is some t- partially based on how many articles I published and whether they're cited and so on and so forth. So whether it's, um, you know, whatever is tracked, everyone, ha- there's so many different jobs that you all have here. So I can't necessarily point to anyone, but we can think about what people pay attention to and ha- what they keep track of. The third is, does it require your specialized skills? If you're in nursing, if you're a physician, if you're um, a postdoc, you know, whatever you're hired to do, are you a researcher? Are you using those skills on the task? If the answer is yes, it's more promotable. So if I am using, even if I'm serving on a committee that's related to conflict resolution, I do work in negotiation. If I'm helping in that regard, I'm at least using my specialized skills. So it's potentially more promotable. So these are the three um, general characteristics of a promotable task. If they are all on the low side, it's probably less promotable. If they are more on the high side, it's more promotable. The third, the last point I wanna make though, is some tasks are what we call indirectly promotable. So they may not help you now in your career, but they might help you later. 
So these are all the things we talk about in terms of networking and meeting new people, developing skills for that you may need in the future. These are all important ways to spend your time, but you can't do too much of it if it's taking time away from what you need here and now. So, you know, if you think about serving on a committee, we say, well, you serve on a committee because you're going to meet people across the hospital or across the institution. That's great the first two years you do it. But, you know, as time goes on, there's diminishing returns and there may be your time may be better spent doing something else. So you can think about all these factors. So once we understood what was promotable and what wasn't promotable, the next thing we wanted to do is say, well, does our experience generalize to other people? In other words, do women in other industries and careers face the same um, pressures that we do? So we started looking to the literature. And the first, and we saw lots of several studies out there that looked at different industries um, and different occupations. And we saw time and time again evidence that women were had less um, exposure and opportunity for promotable tasks, and they were doing more non-promotable tasks. So we saw it in engineering, in law, in high tech, academia, even grocery store workers and TSA agents. I've seen also studies in healthcare workers. Um, this is some data from engineering, and what the, in this study, what you see, in these graphs, what you see is the colored bars uh, represent women of different races, and the black bar is represents white men. And in this survey, what you what we saw is that women reported that they were less likely to be assigned to high profile tasks. They had less access to desirable assignments than their colleagues, as compared to their male colleagues. Um, and this was even worse for women of color. Uh, they also had asked about office housework. So that one category I had talked about at the end, in this case, they were, they were focusing on um, things like uh, finding a time for people to meet, taking notes at meetings, planning office parties, and so on. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that the women were doing much more of this than their male colleagues. So this was some interesting evidence, but it's all self-report. It's all people saying, well, how much do I believe I'm doing in comparison to other people? We wanted to quantify it. We wanted to get a sense of, well, how big could this difference be, at least in one industry? So we worked with a uh, consulting firm. And the beauty of working with a consulting firm or a professional services firm is they track time. They have billable time, and non-billable time. And this organization also kept track of different categories of work. Like, are you working with a client right now? Or, or how much time are you spending mentoring others and even engaged in community service? So they had these records. They looked at the data over three years and they separated it out by women who were senior partners, like already partners versus those who were associates at lower levels, junior versus senior, and then compared the men to the women in terms of how they were spending their time. So what they found is that in terms of the non-promotable work, the women were spending about 200 more hours per year than their male colleagues on non-promotable tasks. 200 more hours is a month of extra work that doesn't advance their career. And this was happening both at the junior level and the senior level. So then the next question that one you might ask is, well, what about the promotable work? What's happening there? And here the story was different for the junior and the senior women versus men. So I'll start with the junior. The junior women, these were associates, were spending 250 fewer hours per year on promotable work. So they were engaged in this trade-off, right? They were doing less promotable work, more non-promotable work. And it may be because they were just managing their time. It may be because they had less opportunities to do the promotable work. But whatever it is, it's not a great trade-off to make because they're spending less time than their colleagues on work that's going to advance their career and more time on the non-promotable. The story for the senior women was different. They were just working 250 more hours a year than their male colleagues in total. They were doing the same amount of promotable work, but they were adding on top of that another month of non-promotable work. This is work overload, 
right? And this may be why they were senior women in the firm. This is why they were successful. They either learned not to make that trade-off or learned that they couldn't survive in the organization by making that trade-off. Uh, so when you put it together, you know, there's a clear picture of inequity here, but the story goes much further than that because of the negative impact that this would have on women in the organization and their careers. So let, we want to talk about the impact both of, I'll start with work, work and balance. So this is what the junior consultants had. They had work, work and balance. So their non-promotable work, the ratio of that to their promotable work was off as compared to their male colleagues, right? Everyone does some non-promotable work, but they were doing more and less of the promotable. And when you have your work, work imbalance, um, and when it's imbalanced and, and in place, uh, we can see several negative outcomes. So the first is career stagnation, right? If you have less opportunity to do the work that advances your career and you're sp <clears throat> spending time being pigeonholed to the non-promotable, um, excuse me, you can see situations where there's, where um, obviously you're not being tapped. You're not reaching your full potential. One second. Uh, excuse me. And with fewer opportunities to demonstrate your value add to the organization, you'll, your opportunities slow down. But these women also experienced a loss of confidence in their own career choice. So we see this, um, actually this was my colleague Linda's experience. She was doing a lot of administrative committee work. It was pulling her away from the time to do her research. She was having a, problems attracting new students to work with her. And she started questioning whether this you know, research academic career was right for her or whether she was capable of doing it. Um, and if, if, when you put this together, it's a very stressful work situation to be, and people tend to be getting and less satisfied with their jobs and consider leaving. So that's work, work, and balance. Um, so the, the second set of outcomes relates to work, uh, work overload and the problems of work overload. So this, this is what the senior consultants experienced. And we can start with, um, the impact that that has on your work family balance, right? When you're working extra hours and long hours, it cuts into the time you have to spend in downtime, right? With your family, with your friends, just on your own. And of course, we know that leads to stress and burnout and all the health side effects that relate to that when you're working long extra hours. Um, and what we also know is when people are overburdened and overworked, and, and stressed and burned out, it, people would then withdraw and potentially resign or, or walk away from the work. And I know we see this a lot in the workforce right now, both in terms of people walking away after COVID um, from their jobs, but also this phenomenon of uh, quiet quitting, right? So what is that all about? Um, and how do, does work overload tie into that where we're saying, well, we need to pull back from the our, our jobs and what we argue is well let's look at how much non-promotable work you're doing and how is that contributing to this feeling of being overtapped by the organization okay there we go all right this is not just a negative outcome for women but it also harms organizations it harms the institution as well uh, and institutions will suffer. So if you know, imagine situations where a subset of your talent pool is not being effectively utilized, right? So let's say, you know, in this case, let's say you have 50% men and women. If half of your workforce is being overburdened, you're not using their the skill sets that you hire them for. And that's an inefficient use of people. And when you're not using your talent pool effectively, um, your productivity will drop. Um, and of course you, you will lose people. So there's a lot of talent um, that's lost, but we also develop with this culture of inequity. When you're in a workforce where some, a subset of people are carrying the burden, we, we look around and we see that. And um, there's been examples of people actually stepping back on their own saying, well, if you're not doing it, I'm not going to do it. 
So that's one outcome. And then you have a culture of no, of no one pitching and a lot of free riders. But on the other hand, then you just have, if, if the women are doing the work, there's resentment toward the men and uh, then there be conflict can arise. There, this lack of opportunity is a major driver of turnover in organizations. In fact, um, there was a survey done by McKinsey and Lean In. They do one every year looking at the state of work. And they show that the, one of the top two reasons that women, that all people actually leave the workforce is to pursue better opportunities for career growth. And in fact, there's one survey that was of over 4,000 women from 70 different countries. And it showed that a major, major reasons women leave the work is because it's not, the work is not meaningful or interesting. The opportunities for advancement are limited and the rewards for the skills and abilities and talents are lacking. You look at all of those reasons, they tie to being overburdened, not having promotable work at your disposal and also being overburdened with non-promotable work. Okay, so it's, it's depressing, right? This is, we think, well, what are we going to do about this? Uh, to, under, to come up with solutions, we have to understand first what the root cause is. Why are women ending up doing the bulk of non-promotable tasks? What's the driver of this? Is it just that we can't say no? So we decided to do our, um, some experimental research to really understand root causes. And there are three possible explanations for this kind of supply and demand. One is we just tend to be asked more. Another possible explanation is we say yes more than men do. And finally, there's a the, the third possibility is that, well, we just volunteer to do this work. We offer, and that's why we're doing it. So we wanted to know what was driving it. So what we did is we ran a, an experimental study um, that was designed to um, look at who, we started with the phenomenon of who volunteers first to do a task that benefits the group, but comes at a cost to the person doing it. So imagine, you know, it's like mimicking the situation where you're in a meeting, somebody has to take the notes, write them up and distribute them after the meeting. It's nobody's job. And everyone's kind of waiting to see who's gonna volunteer to do the task. No one really wants to do it. It's got to be done. And I know, and I know I've been there, you know, all of a sudden someone's looking for a volunteer and everyone's phone all of a sudden is really, there's something really important that email came in, the text came in um, and we, everyone averts their eyes, looks down, start, starts rifling through their papers. Nobody wants to do the task. So, but someone needs to volunteer and somebody eventually does. So this was the situation we were trying to mimic. So we set up a, a study where we had groups of three people um, and that every time you did it, it was a different group of three, but it included men and women that were randomly mixed together. One person had to volunteer to do a very simple task that would benefit everyone, but would be costly to them uh, when they did it. And the first one to volunteer got the job. And if no one volunteered before time ran out, everyone would suffer. Everyone paid the price. Uh, so this was done multiple times. And what we found after running this over multiple trials is that women were 50% more likely to, to be the one to volunteer than the men, 50% more likely. In each round that we did this, women volunteered a little more than a third of the time. Remember, these are groups of three. Uh, and the men took a different strategy and they volunteered only about 20% of the time or twice across 10 rounds. All right, so, so we saw some baseline data here. Of course, we wanted to know, well, why does this happen? Um, are MPT something women do because they really want to do them or they're better at them? Or perhaps we um, just enjoy ordering lunch or cleaning up after the meeting or, or putting together the team slide deck. Or maybe it's because we're just more cooperative or altruistic or inclined to help others more so than men. Or maybe women do these tasks more than men because that's what's expected of us. Um, and we feel the need to step up. And if we don't do it, who will? All right, so we ran the experiment in same gender groups to try and figure out the answer to this question. So if women are more altruistic or helpful than men, then we'd expect us to volunteer at a higher rate than men, regardless of who else is in the room. Right, it's just, we have a propensity to volunteer. Um, but that's not what happened. So instead, when groups were composed of all men, 
the men increased their rate of volunteering. So when there were no females in the room, the men looked around and said, okay, well, someone else has got to do it. So they stepped up and volunteered. Uh, at the same time, the women who were in the all-female groups, they decreased their rate of volunteering when there was all women in the group compared to when there were some men. When they saw there were other women there, they knew they could wait for someone else to do it. Um, as a result, the men and the women in the same gender groups ended up volunteering at the same rate as each other. That difference went away that we saw. Uh, interestingly, uh, what this boils down to and what we realize is that women were, were volunteering more because of these expectations, right? And we, we, while women are somewhat more cooperative and altruistic, it didn't explain this difference. It didn't explain why they were volunteering more. Okay. So we wanted to know whether these expectations were, were understood by others. That was this something we all knew? Um, and does it affect who we ask? So if they were, of course, you know, said another way, if um, MPTs are driven by expectations, then we should also be asking women to, non, to do non-promotable tasks more than we ask men. So this is the second question. So we ran the study, but now we had a fourth person in the room who played the role of a manager. And their job in this group was to ask someone to volunteer to do the task. Um, and, and so, you know, it's kind of like a situation where you're sitting around and someone says, hey, Lori, would you be willing to take the notes this week? All right. So what we found in this scenario was that the women in the group, when there was a woman in the group, she was um, asked 44% more so than were the men. So the manager was 44% more likely to ask a woman than a man to do this non-promotable task. And this difference held regardless of whether the manager was male or female. Okay, so both men and women were more likely to ask women to volunteer than men. Uh, and this was a well-founded strategy because when asked, the women were 50% more likely to say yes, because they could turn it down. In our study, the women said yes 75% of the time when asked, and the men only said yes 50% of the time. So, so what we determined was that this does generalize. And when we go back to this initial question I asked about why do women end up doing the bulk of non-promotable tasks, our research suggests it's all three reasons. We're asked, we say yes, and we volunteer, but it all boils down to these expectations, these shared expectations that drive the behavior. When we know we're expected to do these things, we often internalize that, and that's why we volunteer. Okay, so um, there's you know this underlying phenomenon of driving our expectations, uh, and they they rely a lot on the um, social roles that we have in our lives. You know that come from many many years of normative behavior that women tend to be the helpers. Um, but it's not that women want to do this work or enjoy doing this work. And when you, when you bring those norms into the workplace, it's very counterproductive. It's also counterproductive potentially at home, but that's not the topic of the talk today. Um, so there's a lot of ways this plays out, right? We ask people that we expect will say yes, because it, you know it's a path of least resistance, right? We know they're gonna say yes, that's who we ask. And we found ourselves doing that when we were in our leadership roles, Lisa at one point put a committee together and sent an email to the rest of us saying, I can't believe I just did this. But I just, she's an economist. There's plenty of men in her department. And she put a committee together of all women because she knew they'd say yes. And it was easier. Um, we ask women to do non-promotable tasks because that's who comes to mind. This goes to this um, stereotype or prototype that we have in our mind of women as helpers. It's also easier to ask someone to do a non-promotable task who has done it before because they already know how to do it, right? So there's an efficiency to that um, argument. And, and again, it's a path of least resistance. Um, we might ask women because we want a female um, representative on a committee, right? So, or, and this is a big issue for people of color, especially. 
right? Is that we want um, diversity of viewpoints, which may be very important, but we always want to ask. So I work in a field where men, women are in the minority and there's this view that we want to have, you know, equal representation of women on all our committees. But if there's only 20% female faculty and you want 50% participation on all the committees, those 20% of the people are going to get overtaxed. And women of color are doubly taxed when they're both underrepresented in terms of their gender and underrepresented in terms of their race. Uh, and finally, we see women being asked to do these types of tasks because uh, there's some, what's called benevolent sexism or the idea that, well, we think we're helping women by giving them these opportunities. May that may not apply to the office housework, but it does apply to some of the committees we sit on. Well, you're going to have an opportunity to meet people or participate in the leadership development program. Those are all important things. But if they're getting in the way of the time you need to do the work that advances your career directly, it can backfire. Okay. All right. So let's then move to this the point of solution. So what can we do to fix the problem? And I'm going to talk about three different types of solutions. I'm going to first focus on what individuals can do from their own perspective to navigate the situation. I'm going to talk about what leaders and managers can do to fix the situation within their work units. And then I'm going to talk about what organizations can do more broadly to fix the systems and how we're, we think about work in general. Okay, so starting with the individual solutions. Um, so I'll start with... Um, you know, we know that women are more likely to say yes and volunteer. So we have a set of solutions here that are things you can do to um, avoid the knee-jerk reaction of raising your hand bef before someone else will, or immediately saying yes, happy to, which is what Brenda found that she always did and had to stop herself from doing. So these first set of suggestions are things you can do to assess the task. What am I being asked to do? Instead of immediately saying yes, say, let me get back to you and then collect more information, ask these questions. Um, how much time is it gonna take? How long do you need? When is the deadline? Who else is working on this? So get the information you need to understand the true burden um, that it will place on you. Of course, you need to consider who's asking you. Is this someone you can say no to? Is this your supervisor? Is it a peer? Is it somebody who you're accountable to or not? Um, and and um, think about the true repercussions. Sometimes we over, we're concerned about um, harming a relationship, but will it harm the relationship? So try to think about it in reality. Um, don't overestimate the cost of saying yes. We often think that um, it won't be too much work. We tend to underestimate how much work something's going to be. Think about when you think uh, you're planning to paint a room in your house. You know, we always think, oh, we'll be able to get it done quickly. And of course it takes, you know, three times as much uh, time to get done. And finally, don't get cornered into saying yes. Give yourself a little bit of time to uh, respond. If you want to say no, you can say no immediately. But if you, your knee-jerk reaction is to say yes, get by yourself some time. Um, Another set of strategies is to think about yourself, right? What is the, doing this task going to, how will it impact you? Think about yourself, not just now, but in the future. Your, your schedule will be as busy then as it is now. Uh, beware of your triggers, right? So why do you feel the need to say yes? You know, is it, do you feel honored to be asked, even though you don't want to do the task? Or do you feel guilty saying no? to someone you care about? Or are you fearful of the negative repercussions that might happen if you say no? So think about what your triggers are for saying yes and make sure you're saying yes for the right reason. Um, and then consider your implicit no. So what are you giving up in order to say yes to this? Where is the time gonna come from? Lisa always used to keep a post-it on her monitor at work with her kids' names because she knew that if she said yes, to writing that referee report on top of all the others she already had to write, that would be less time she'd have to spend with her kids over the weekend because it would cut into her personal time. So she um, was very aware of those trade-offs at every moment. Um, 
On the flip side, when we want to say no, we need to think about how to do so in a way that avoids negative repercussions. This is something that our male colleagues don't really have to deal with as much as we do, again, because of these expectations. When you say no and you're expected to say yes, you're violating an expectation and people may view you negatively. Uh, so while you, when, when you say no, um, you don't want to over explain yourself. What people don't, people think they, um, there's a research study that shows that when you're, uh, when you're asked, when you're going to say no and turn something down, people believe that the other side wants an explanation. I have to justify myself, but actually what the asker wants is you to help them solve their problem to get the work done. So instead of spending a lot of time explaining why you can't do it, which a little bit of it is good, um, instead offer an alternative that helps solve their problem. Is there someone else who can do the task who's not as overburdened as you are? Is there someone who might benefit from doing the task? You've been on this committee for five years. You don't want to do it again, but you know, Joe has never been on it and he could use the, the um, exposure, or maybe, you know, Maria has not been on it yet. And it, she's uh, more uh, junior in her career, and this would be a good opportunity for her. Uh, put conditions on your yes. I can help you, but only this part of the task, or for this period of time, or in this way. Uh, and finally, negotiate uh, what you can unload. So this is something I always did. When I was asked to serve on a committee that is, so in, in, in my field, it's all committee work. And uh, I got tapped a lot because I'm a pretty good committee member. You know, I'm, I get engaged and I participate and I step up. Um, so what I learned to do was um, unload something else from my plate before taking it on. And I'd often go to my boss to get help with that. Say, well, okay, so I've been asked to serve on the student experience committee for the university. It's really important. We have to think about the culture for our students. But I'm on this accreditation committee that really is something doesn't need my specialized skills. I can contribute more to this one and I care more about it than this other. Can you help me get off this university committee to get on to, to give me time for that? And he did. He sent an email to his boss, the provost, saying, you know, Lori would really be prefer to be on this committee. It would be a good fit for her, um, and and they moved it around, so it worked out well. And again, I used my boss to help me do that. So that's another strategy you can do is to enlist your manager. Of course, if they're the ones who are asking you to do the extra work, that's a different strategy. All right, but the goal here is to it's not to say no to everything; it's to right size your NPT load to do the right amount. Um, in comparison to your peers, in comparison to your organizational expectations. So there's two steps, right? One is to start doing an assessment of what you're being asked to do. How do you spend your time? How do others spend their time? What are the expectations? And how do you want to spend your time? So stepping back and looking at this, and this takes, this is work, but it's worth it. And then the second is asking, well, how are you going to adjust it? What can you let go? Uh, who can take it on? and who's gonna help you make the change. Um, our goal, I think the personal goal for any individual is to end up with a low, uh, workload of non-promotable tasks that are right for you, right? That, and everybody's different in terms of what's right for them. So from the organization's perspective, you may get a lot of these tasks picked up if everybody is going through this assessment. This was something I always did. You know, um, What are the NPTs that fulfill me, that I care very much about um, DEI work. I was always happy to be on the committees, the data committees, though. I wanted to, I, I have data analytics skills, so I wanted to combine those two and serve on committees where we would do a really good assessment of the current state of the organization. So that was something I was always willing to do. Um, it also provided a good return on my time spent because I felt like I was making a difference. Um, and again, you know, this idea of giving me a mental break. Sometimes, you know, research is long haul. Doing an NPT, I saw immediate results when I was on some of these, you know, when I was doing some of these analytical tasks, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, and then it also fit in in my career stage, right? I did these, the big ones I did sequentially as opposed to simultaneously. 
because if you say no, what I learned, what we all learned is if I say no now to an opportunity that's maybe non-promotable, I'll get asked again. If I, you know, it's not one and done. All right. So these are individual strategies you can do to navigate the situation yourself. But of course, as I mentioned, this doesn't solve the problem that you're going to keep getting asked and that women tend to get asked more than men. So now I want to talk to about more ways we can change the culture of our organizations and how things are done. Now, individuals do have a role to play in this, right? Individuals can see change through more of a grassroots movement um, by creating awareness of the problem and then taking some action. So we talk a lot about them uh, but in, in the book, but the, the, it boils down to um, starting to talk to your peers about non-promotable tasks in relatable terms. You know, when someone is being voluntold in a meeting, I guess this is going to be on the take action side, um, interject before that person takes it on and say, you know, oh, you know, Marie has done that before. Joanne has done it before. That's really a non-promotable task. Use the language. Let's let someone else take their turn. Right. And, and just start getting people thinking about it. You don't even have to talk about it in terms of gender. And in your group, maybe you're all women and there's still a dis unequal distribution. You can still have these conversations um, tie the, and tie it back to what the organization cares about. If you're talking to management, you know, if management really does care about retaining their workforce, then paying attention to this problem is in their best benefit. And of course, mobilizing allies is key. I also want to point to the um, point here about mentoring early colleagues. Oftentimes, new members of the organization don't know what's promotable and what's not promotable. And so they may be saying yes to things they shouldn't be or too many of them. So you can mentor them to help them understand what's a good use of their time. So that's from the individual perspective. From the management perspective, what managers can do to fix the problem, um, there's really low hanging fruit here. Uh, the first is, you know, change how you hand out non-promotable tasks. Stop asking for volunteers because we know women are more likely to volunteer. Instead, take turns, draw names out of a hat, or even better, assign the task strategically. Get, do, have your employees do an assessment, a, you know, a rough assessment of what they're doing. What committees are you on? What non-promotable tasks are you doing? Who's doing what? And take a look. And if it's unequal, just move some things around, reassign and redistribute um, current non-promotable tasks to make that more optimal. And finally, of course, you know, increase the talent pool. Train more people up to do these tasks, right? So if I've done the office party for the past five years, now, maybe I enjoy it, and that's the NPT I want to keep, and that's okay. But if I really am tired of it, you know, let someone else do it with me, and they can take it over next time. Again, these social gatherings may be really important to, these, to the culture of the group, but the same person doesn't have to be doing it over and over again. Um, and managers also have a responsibility to engage, educate their employees about the promotability of tasks, and also to make sure that they're not taxing their underrepresented members of their group with these tasks. Like it's my job as a manager to make sure that's not happening. Um, this is one thing I did when I was an associate dean is the first thing I did, you know, I was already a member of the No Club and we hadn't written the book yet, but I, we wanted to, um, I, wanted, I was curious on who was doing what. Nobody was tracking it. So we put together a spreadsheet of all the names and the gender, which I knew everyone, and all their committees with just within the school, not all the outside work they did, and just looked at the distributions. And not surprisingly, you know, men were at one end of the distribution and women were at the other more so. And we just had to move some assignments around and it made it a little bit more equivalent. Okay. Um, but it, it, so the manager can influence the local distribution, but organizations have an opportunity to look at. Uh, their expectations and norms of NPTs and regularize it, right? So we oftentimes this is invisible work. People don't pay attention to it. So if we are, care about it, we're going to start um, identifying what's promotable and non-promotable, setting ranges of expectations, minimum and maximum, and then enforcing standards 
for doing them to make sure that people are pulling their weight. Uh, and maybe even providing some extra incentives to those who are doing more MPTs to attract more people to them, not to just say, oh, well, we'll, you know, we'll give you a gift card or a pat on the back. Thank you for continuing to be overburdened, but use these incentives to get more people involved. Um, another strategy is to redesign work, right? There are non-promotable tasks for me as a professor that would be very promotable for an administrative assistant to do. Right. So if I'm planning a conference, I it's great for me to invite the high status speakers, but I don't shouldn't be the one reserving the rooms, ordering the food. So we move that task to an administrative assistant who hadn't done that work before. And they and it was actually he took on the task and it became part of his performance evaluation. And uh, and he was excellent at the work. And it was, it was a great move, right? It freed me up to do more promotable work on my side, and it made the work promotable for him. And of course, we need to reconsider what we evaluate and what we consider as promotable or not. Here, DEI work falls right into that um, arena. Many organizations, most organizations have in their mission statement um, concern and care about DEI work and, and making sure that an organization is more equitable and inclusive, and, and uh, the sense of belongingness is shared. People feel like they belong. Uh, but it doesn't often make its way into performance evaluations for people who move the needle on that. So let's pay attention to that. Walk the talk. And you know, while that will benefit the individuals, it will also benefit the organization. Right? People will be more satisfied and engaged. It's a more efficient use of our workforce. Uh, and it will lead to more retention. And, you know, we're all so short staffed right now. The better your organization is to uh, promote, provide um, equal and equivalent workloads, the more likely we are to retain our best employees. So with that, I'll stop. I'll say thank you very much for having me. I hope you found the talk useful and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you.